Welcome back, everybody, to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and I'm here with Jason Brashear at Pine Mountain Settlement School. And it's a great place, but he works here, is the, the coordinator yep. here, so he's going to tell us a lot about Pine Mountain Settlement School, a Kentucky treasure, in my opinion, up here in Harlan County, southeastern Kentucky. Yep. We're absolutely uh, excited to be on here and excited to have you here on campus. Uh, so Pine Mountain Settlement School started all the way back in 1913 and has been uh, involved in education uh, since. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk history in a little bit, but uh, it's, it's kind of evolved throughout its 109-year history. And, and now we offer uh, enrichment programs for schools uh, ac- across the region. Uh, we have uh, schools that uh, come here uh, for environmental and cultural programs um, and uh, from Lexington, Louisville, Illinois, uh, Tennessee, Alabama. Uh, so we have a, a kind of a broad mm-hmm. geographic range that comes here. Uh, those students are, uh, are residential students so they'll come here spend a couple nights uh, they'll take all sorts of classes uh, on different things, and it's according to the, the teacher and the class and what they're mm-hmm. going over. Sometimes it's very heavy uh, humanities-based, and we're talking about early settlers and Native Americans, and um, you know we're weaving and we're cabin building and, and uh, a lot of traditional arts. You know We may be uh, in the kitchen talking about uh, food and, and the culture and history of food uh, here in the region or, or have a guest speaker in talking about uh, Appalachian music and and traditions, of course, we, we love to folk dance and play play party <laughs> games, and uh, uh, you know, so that's kind of part of our program. We also do a lot of things in our community, and and are actually ramping our community efforts up quite a bit. Uh, so in the community, we uh, run a Grow Appalachia program through Bria College. We work with about forty five families, and and we'll produce somewhere around um, somewhere around. Uh, 20 tons of food Mm -hmm. uh, with those families Uh, uh, so it's a a really neat thing Uh, uh, run summer camps we have a little league here Um, uh, we just started uh, working with South Arts uh, doing after school arts programs Uh, we just finished up a sheep to shawl class so well, um, well, we're gonna. What is a sheep to shawl class? <laughs> sheep to shawl class. So basically, students come in and they learn everything from sheep in the field to a finished product. Yeah. Uh, so we started uh, with our with our flock of sheep here on campus. Uh, they learn to uh, process wool, wash it, cart it, spin it, dye mm-hmm. it, uh, and then actually got to go to the looms. And you know, we have a wonderful loom. Uh, 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 weaving studio mm-hmm. i call it the loom room <laughs> uh, and uh, you know we've got uh, plenty of uh, of looms some of them dating back to the 40s yeah. uh, that folks can come here and weave on and yeah. and uh, so those students got to weave and actually do a finished product yeah uh, and it was pretty awesome to, to watch them they got some of them got really excited and interested several have come back and uh, just been like hey can can we go weave uh, so it's you know it's kind of started a little bit of a fire in some young folks and uh uh, so that was a community program. We're getting ready uh, next week. We will start a uh, Appalachian Foodways program. Uh, so we'll have uh, uh, six weeks of teaching uh, young folks how to cook some traditional Appalachian meals. So any, anything from uh, cornbread and biscuits to chicken and dumplings to fried <laughs> apple pies and stack cakes. So. Well, we def- definitely need to be teaching the the young kids that because my, my grandma won't live forever. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got to make that right. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're pretty excited with that, and and then have started a, a program called Pass It On Pine Mountain, which is a a monthly program that that passes on traditional arts to the community yeah. for both young and old. So uh, it actually meets the second um, the second and third Thursday of the month. Uh, and we'll do uh, some sort of traditional art, whether it's uh, corn shuck flowers. Uh, to actually, uh, we'll be doing a, uh, this week we've got one um, uh, on hand sewing and, and hand piecing a quilt uh, to uh, a wood a woodworking class. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of broad range, but just an easy uh, free of charge event for, for our community to just pop in and, and, yeah. and, and, and do. Um, the newest thing, though, that we're, we're starting is called Experience Pine Mountain. Uh, mm-hmm. And we just launched our new website, experiencepinemountain.com, and that gives folks the ability to come in here and experience this place. This place is um, over a thousand acres, a 350-acre nature preserve, 10 miles of hiking trails, mm-hmm. uh, and it's just a truly spectacular place that has more beauty in it than you can even imagine. Uh, so we want to open that up um, with uh, 
uh, with some small groups and, and families. And we've got plenty of lodging here on campus and lots of things to do. So you can uh, get on our website, or reserve a cabin, come and stay mm-hmm. for the weekend. And also, uh, you want a guided hike to uh, up the Wintergreen Trail or do you want to... Um, Go to the summit. <laughs> Go to the summit, which is a, a very intense trail taking you to the main peak of Pine Mountain. Uh, or whether you want to, to uh, be in our blacksmith studio and, and learn to blacksmith and actually do something that you get to take home or our weaving shop. Uh, so we have all kinds of experiences mm-hmm. that they can do as well. So uh, programs here has always very bit, been very much place-based and experiential in terms of learning. Uh, lots of hands-on, and, and that's still kind of what we're trying to do today. Well, and I, I, that's one thing I really enjoy about coming here is the hands-on because oftentimes, you know, you hear... Kids these days don't know how to do anything or, you know, they're always playing with their phones and this and that. Well, you know, you come to Pine Mountain and they're going to learn some hands-on stuff. I mean, we had students just yesterday working those looms, you know, and you get, you get them. They get, they get to liking it. And they, you know, it's the old saying, idle hands are the devil's playground. You know, you give them something to do, something hands-on to do, and they love it. I mean, kids have loved it forever. You know, I, and I'm, I'm fairly new here. I've been here so I guess eight months and Mm -hmm. and when we started kind of putting together our new programmer and our new staff after COVID I kept thinking I don't I don't are kids going to really relate to these looms are they going to like it (laughs) um you know what are they going to think this is dumb and old and we're not doing it and so many students that is their one of their favorite classes uh, especially in terms of art that is their favorite class they love to be able to do that uh, and I think the coolness is that they get to see that progress. So each time mm-hmm. that they each time that they pass that uh, that shuttle through, you know, they they see a pattern uh, and they and they get excited and they get good and they get fast and they just you know and it's very soothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I think it is it is it gives them something to do with their hands other than to hold that phone. <laughs> yeah, and, and on, honestly, I mean, if I'm thinking about it, you know, a lot of times you get on these phones, you play these games. You know, in that loom, I mean, it's the same. You know, you're doing the same thing over. In a way, it's it can be considered a yep. game if you have to spruce it up a little bit. Yep. Uh, that, that, that is difficult. If yep. you are not paying attention, you will mess up and you will be in a world of hurt. I, you, <laughs> some people probably don't, probably don't exactly know what a loom is, I guess. Um, but I understand once that uh, machines were able to make it a little easier. Well, you know, I, I sat back and and the the great thing about this place is we also have a tremendous archive and mm-hmm. uh, you know it's a national historic landmark and uh, many of our buildings uh, are are archives themselves. Uh, but in our weaving room and our spinning and dyeing room, we actually have a um, a linen dress uh, from our founder's wife, Sal, oh, yeah. uh, Aunt Sal's dress, and and to think about the work she had to put into that just to get a dress. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's really kind of mind blowing and, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's a gorgeous piece of work and uh, it's but, last it's hundred years but old it's hundred yeah. years old and, yeah. and, uh, and and the crazy thing about it like if if you look at it you think oh yeah it's it's pretty but if you flip it on the inside you actually see the color of it and the vibrant colors that she used natural dyes to make yeah. is uh, is is pretty intense yeah it's it's some it's some good stuff uh, the other. The other thing to bring up too, when we talk about your know, kids working on stuff, and and uh, you know adults can do come and do it as well, uh, but when you're talking about cabin building, you know, we're we're giving kids some tools that you know you, they probably aren't used to using. Yeah, act, not a full on axe, but you have the the um, oh, what is that? I'm leaving me the horse horse shear. So we got the the mallet and the fro, and mm-hmm. we got to sit on the uh, the the draw bench with the draw knife and make wooden shingles. They'll get yeah. on a cross cut saw uh, and. Uh, uh, cut uh, uh, cut a, a, a kind of a tree cookie off and mm-hmm. uh, or we see if a class can do it sometimes yeah. they get through it and sometimes they wear out way before we didn't get through it <laughs> <laughs> but you know and, but it's given them an, an opportunity to see uh, and, and kind of live some history yeah uh, that's part of our early settlers class which is uh, probably uh, between early settlers and our stream ecology class those are probably our favorites yeah. and and you know, with the early settlers, they get they get a chance to understand what it was like a little bit um, through that through those classes because they hands on see how long it takes to you know to to weave a six inch piece of cloth and imagine having to weave something that you're gonna wear. Yeah, yeah, and how you know if you're gonna wear this, you do not need to make a mistake because yeah. it's gonna you need it to last a hundred years even That's right. you know. That's so right. a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of good life lessons. I feel like you know. Uh, around here 
Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and you know, and our, you know, I mentioned our other favorite class, our streams class. You know, environmental education has been kind of the the, the core here uh, since the mid seventies, and and that that um, uh, streams class. You know, we it's it's a simple concept. We uh, it's a, a biological test mm-hmm. in the water using macroinvertebrates. Uh, some of them, uh, most of our students have never been in a creek or have yeah. never touched a crawdad, and um, <laughs> and you know. That's the class I normally teach or, or have have been teaching here recently, and you'll hear them up and down the creek scream and holler <laughs> when they get something, and it, you know it's just their excitement. And I was doing a, a kind of a, a reflection time at the end of a of a school group here like two weeks ago, and uh, a kid stood up and said, "You know, this is the first time I've ever stood in between trees, oh, and I've ever wow. touched trees. This is the first time that I have ever been in a creek. I've been in water." I've been in the ocean, I've never been in a creek. Yeah. Um, wow. So it, you know, it's giving you know giving them that ability to be able to connect, mm-hmm. to disconnect and reconnect with something else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they disconnect with that phone, and some of them struggle real hard mm-hmm. uh, with that. But then they get to reconnect with things, and and they quickly find there's lots of things to do without that phone in their hand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, to be on the nature side of things, there's so much stuff you can do. In nature. Now, if the the students are coming from maybe the city, you know that's a bit more. You know, there's parks and stuff, I guess, as well. But you know, that's that's what I think. You know, there's stuff out there you can enjoy a creek. I mean, me and my brothers, we had a creek that was right down the road from us. I mean, in the summer we went down there all the time. Now, you know, was it the best place? Uh, was it the best place to for us to be unsupervised? Maybe not, but you know, we just the only the worst thing that happened was we brought back some stray puppies. That's you know, right. that's it. Yeah. You know, and who doesn't need stray puppies, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, my my mom and dad did not <laughs> did not need any. Uh, but but yeah, that's 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 how it goes. That's really um, that's really one thing I enjoy a lot about it is giving them that connection to the environment. What, yes. What's right there now in Crab Orchard? We're we're a pretty rural community anyway you know a lot of our kids they you want to go get in a they're creek old. yeah let's go get in a creek um but even then there there's even those that you're kind of like breaking that you know put your phone away let's get let's do something together here and it, i mean it's the world we live in the one question i get asked the most is can we bring our phones are our phones okay to have on the bus you know it's like come on guys yeah. let's yeah. put our phones in our pockets no but, doubt but you know our, our programs uh, are, are very broad and we offer lots of uh, uh, unique things. Uh, we'll offer a, um, uh, a fall arts weekend, which is a, a, an arts program. Well, uh, we, we do guided hikes. Uh, we do a quarterly guided hike series. Uh, um, one, we've got a spring wildfly hike that will we'll start here, I guess, the second week of May. And um, we kind of quarterly will do a uh, kind of edible hike um, and then uh, we got, a, of course, our uh, midsummer's hike uh, mm-hmm. in the summer, along with our farmers market, and then a, a, a fall colors hike yeah. uh, uh, in October to, to just bring awareness to the beauty and and you know and we've got some really tremendous trails here, so mm-hmm. uh, those are for anybody that would like to come out to those, and you can always go to our website pinemountainsettlementschool.com or experience Pine Mountain. Well, I'm Preston Jones. I'm the executive director here at Pine Mountain Settlement School. And been, uh, lived in Harlan County most of my life. Uh, went to school at UK and then on to Eastern for, for my master's. And I feel uh, blessed and fortunate to have found my way back home and, and to work here at this special place. I've been here at Pine Mountain for about eight years now. Uh, but my first memory of Pine Mountain goes back to about third grade uh, on a day trip over here with a local school. I uh, came over and experienced Pine Mountain that way and for the first time and uh, I still remember the guided hike to Split Rock <laughs> and getting to hold the snake and, and weaving and, and just, you know, this place, uh, it, it just has a way of sticking in your memory and and a lot of times we talk about it, you know, it's the challenge for us is just getting people here for the first time. Mm-hmm. And nine times out of ten when they come and they experience uh, not only the place but the amazing programs and the, and the staff that we have, they want to come back. And, and you can't forget about Pine Mountain when you've had that, when you've had that taste of it. So 
um, you know, I talk a lot about that, and, and it just, it, it really is amazing to, to think about that we're still here, we're still serving the children and families of the Kentucky Mountains, the Bluegrass State, and beyond, and we've done that now for over a hundred years. Uh, it really is a special place in an organization, so, um, you know, the programs that we provide today, you know, we focus on uh, environment and conservation education, uh, traditional Appalachian culture and craft, and agriculture and the beautiful thing about our program is that all of those core focuses are interwoven and interconnected in so many ways and and just like I said just being in this place that has a working campus farm a 350 acre state nature preserve a thousand total acres um, a historic landmark national historic landmark 20 historic structures um, you know and the list goes on and on the craft facilities weaving studio pottery studio uh, blacksmith shop, wood shop. Um, you know, it really, it really, really is something that is unique, uh, mm -hmm. not only to the region, but I would, I would dare say the world. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not a lot of places that have all that in one, yeah. in one location. So, um, it's you know, we, we just we love it uh, when when people get to come and experience that, um, you know, for the first time or for the fiftieth yeah. time and. It never gets old, you know. Seeing seeing people come through and experience all that we've got. What what we end up seeing with with our with our guests, whether it's their first time here or their fiftieth time, we've got some reunions during the summer that we work that they've been this. It's been their family reunion spot for years, uh, but it, it's this sense of wonder and amazement for the story and the history mm -hmm. and then of the grounds and you know it's it's hard to be here and and. And not feel a connection to place yeah. uh, regardless if you know anything about the place just coming here if you just stay just a few just a few minutes you start to feel that connection to place and once you hear the story you feel even more connected and tied into it and you know I think that's something that a lot of folks may miss uh, and and really latch on to and I think that's one of the things that that in terms of programs or, or appeal that we have for mm -hmm. folks uh, just being able to connect somewhere yeah this is pretty awesome yeah well and that, that's you know you talk about the first time coming you know i know crab orchard we were talking about that earlier today like how long has crab orchard been coming mm -hmm. i mean it's been 15 16 some years yep. but for me this is only my the you know, i started this is my ninth year of teaching you know the person who was here before me you know the, or that brought me the first time he mm -hmm. retired mm -hmm. and of course the question is well are you all still going to go to pine mountain even though mr pope's retiring right. so well, yeah we're still going to go <laughs> you know yeah we're not going to stop that right. yeah. that's it's it's too you know i guess you know to say you know you're hooked you yeah. know yeah. We, i look forward to it every year and I, of course i'm looking at it as a teacher perspective but your know, families can come you mentioned yeah. you know right. cabins yeah. and so forth but like and isn't there a uh, wildlife or flower or what's the, what's the those yeah so uh, spring wildflower weekend is is a program that we have run for for years and years and jason mentioned fall colors uh, fall arts we've we've always had this series of of kind of quarterly adult and family focused weekends um now it's been a little a little bit of a struggle reviving those post covid and and we we've got plans and and i think by fall we'll be back on track with those but uh, this spring instead of doing the the full-on wildflower weekend we're going to offer a series of free guided hikes for people to, mm -hmm. to come and explore and of course the trails are open yeah. sun up to sun down you know we're, we're basically a, a park in that way that you can come and access the trails and, and explore on your own and we've got mm -hmm. campus maps that are available and um, and all of that but yeah it's just there beyond the beyond the more you know tangible pieces of the work and the, the physical place and things like that there's the, there's just there's just something about pine mountain and, and Catherine Pettit, Ethel DeLong, the founders, they all understood it. And they wrote about it as the spirit of Pine Mountain. Mm -hmm. they, a lot of times they would sign off on their, mm -hmm. their letters in the spirit of Pine Mountain. And, yes. uh, and it's just, we get that from people all the time, that there's just something, something special mm -hmm. and unique and, and sacred about this place, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I encourage people all the time. And I wish, you know, the sc other schools in our district would even come as, as well. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's a great place, a great place to bring kids. You know, there was one time I remember we had a group of students, and there was a family up in one of the I don't know if it remember if it was Far House or the what's the one beside Far House? Zondi. Zondi. It might have been that one. Mm -hmm. um, and those cabins were good as well, because uh, just uh, another plug, I guess. A few years ago, the renovations to the dorms was happening, so we all got put in cabins that time. 
and I mean, they, they were just as good as the dorms. We had all the stuff we needed. Um, you know, if you, could, you know, like one of my students said, are we gonna have to walk uphill? And I'm like, you're gonna have to walk uphill everywhere. You know? <laughs> you know, so you know, if you're coming in, you don't think you're gonna do some walking uphill. It's gonna happen uh, one way or the other. It's, it's uphill both ways. <laughs> yeah, 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 water. Yeah, yeah. And, and but you know, the trails, uh, like I said, are really good. There, there's a summit trail. Um, now, if you bring a bunch of kids, it's gonna be a long one. Uh, I think me and a uh, me and a few parents did it one time on our own, yep. which it didn't take us that long. But you know, it was just like three of us, four of us, right. and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's steep. So you know, for those people who are hikers hikers out there, there's there's plenty of, of that as well. Um, and, and this is my own Black Mountain's the highest Highest peak but it's not it's a little farther down in it it's just on the other side it's on the next ridge south yeah Yeah. okay got pine mountain and black mountain yeah yeah Yeah. well um as far as anything else you all can think of that would i guess entice people or that they need to know about that's offered i mean i think we hit quite a bit but if there's anything else just the you know we always talk of course with the programs and and uh, and you know it's a, much of the experience is mm-hmm. the natural environment yeah. of course we're surrounded by mm-hmm. um, pristine forest land and, and just that that ecosystem you know we sit in one of the most diverse uh, ecosystems in the temperate zone a lot of our forest is what is considered a mixed mesophytic forest mm-hmm. and just the diversity of trees and 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 shrubs and flowers it's it really is astounding when you get out and you and you look at it with that with that understanding mm-hmm. of, of diversity I, I certainly think it's it's a place that um if you enjoy if you enjoy history if you enjoy culture if you enjoy the environment it's a place for you yeah. uh and it, whether you decide to come here and and create a full itinerary of experiences and add-ons to your stay or you just come and stay for the weekend and explore on your own. I think you're going to find a place that that you're going to feel at home and you're going to feel connected to uh, shortly after you arrive. Uh, and it is it's 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 that that diversity that makes it. You know, you can come uh, four times a year and see four different mountains. Uh, and you know, and that's it. You know, and you know, right now we're in the spring and spring wildflowers are blooming everywhere and and. You know, it's it's pretty exciting, and I'm not I'm not the plant person. I, I, my background is certainly not in in plants, but it, it's so exciting to to go on a trail that I was on two days ago, and then then here's this beautiful trout lily sitting beside the trail, and you're like, wow, uh, you know. And so it's you know, Miss Judy, our community uh, coordinator, says all the time is, you know, folks nature presents itself to you all the time you just mm-hmm. got to keep your eyes open yep. Yep. and there's so much truth in that mm-hmm. uh, you could come here a million times and not see it the same way yeah right and and you know i think too about this place as a as essentially a base camp for further exploration of the region so mm-hmm. you know harlan county and, and the adjacent counties there's so much history mm-hmm. and culture and and uh, things to do and see and i think awareness of, of that is growing and you know there's really no better place to to station and and base camp like i said and go out and explore uh the region you know than pine mountain it's a perfect place to do that so yeah Yeah. wow that sounds good you guys put it put it put it well shift over this uh like you said kentucky history podcast so this place is full of history let's start let's start all the way back back when when the creatures showed up and and uh how that progressed i mean uh, from there yeah, it, it, it's an amazing story, and uh, it never gets old telling it. Uh, you know, William William Creech uh, grew up over on the south side of the mountain in what they call Poor Fork, kind of Cumberland, uh, Benham Winds, Tri Cities area, as it's known now. Um, and yeah, he was a Civil War veteran, went and fought for the Union Army, and uh, found his way back home to the mountains, and and married uh, Sally Dixon Creech there, and they lived. Uh, on his on his father's farm uh, over on Poor Fork, and there's a you know a lot of writing in the archives, and that's how we, you know we thank we're so thankful we have a wonderful record. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean our archives are very 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 detailed and, and extensive, and and if you're interested, you can go for yourself and explore PineMountainSettlement.net, 
Um, that is, that's where a lot of our uh, digital archives are housed. Of course, we've got a lot of things that have never been digitized, and that's an ongoing project, and we're, uh, we're looking to, to um, expand those efforts here very soon. Actually, we just hired a part-time archivist and, uh, and communications associate, which we're very, hired, very, very excited about. But anyway, so, you know, reading through the archives, that's where we kind of get a lot of this information. Um, but, you know, William and Sally, they lived on the farm over there, realized that the the soil was was shot. It wasn't the best and most productive land, and uh, he had heard about some wild land over on the head of Greasy, and so I think they moved moved over here. He bought, I'm thinking, it's something like five five hundred acres for maybe fifty dollars or so. I can't remember exactly, but it was something in that ballpark. And so they move over here, and they they began the work of, of building their cabin, which is still out here today. The the mm -hmm. Creech cabin that you drive right by when you come on campus, and uh, you know, they raised, I think, 12, 12 children in that cabin uh, over time, of course, not all. You know, I'm sure they, they were spread out a little bit, but, uh, you know, that pioneer lifestyle, it was, uh, you know, it was very much alive then. And you got to think, you know, this was late 1800s, early 1900s. And, you know, a lot of the a lot of the United States and and, uh, and the West had, had uh, industrialized and, and started to, you know, to advance very rapidly. But over here. It was almost as if that culture eddied out. I've, I've read uh, writing, they talk about the culture eddying out, you know, that flow uh, eddying, eddying out against the north side of Pine Mountain. And so what that did was preserve a lot of those uh, those old traditions and, and those, especially the Scots-Irish and, and English settlers mm -hmm. and, and German that, that had found their way into the, into the Appalachians. And so... Um, they settled the valley uh, along with other families, of course, and uh, you know William had recognized a need uh, a better uh, a better educational uh, arrangement and opportunities for his children. Um, and you know we've got the old man's hopes, and he said uh, he said in his famous words that he had a heart and craving that his people may grow better. He said he wanted all youngins taught to serve the living God. He said, of course, they won't all do that, but they can have good and evil laid before them, mm -hmm. and they can choose which they may. Yeah. And so with that in mind, he deeded his land to the Pine Mountain Settlement School and uh, Catherine Pettit, uh, you know, of course she had, she had come from Hindman and, and uh, was connected to Creech actually by an old circuit riding preacher named Reverend Lewis Little who knew Creech here in the community and knew Pettit uh, in her work in Hindman and, uh, and he knew I, that uh, Pettit was looking to move on and, and do something a little different and he connected the two and, and they, uh, they came and surveyed the land and the rest is history. Uh, they, it's funny they wrote about it as like you know they were kind of skeptical about this being the being the place for their for their new endeavor. But when they came and they saw this this valley and they got to talk to the people and and saw the desire in their hearts to uh, to better their children and, and the families that uh, they knew this was it. And so mm -hmm. they they began immediately starting to build. Uh, Big Log was the first new. Uh, a new build on campus and uh, Pettit lived there for the first few years with the boarding school students and you know of course the school grew and grew over time mm -hmm. and they added added buildings and of course can't forget they recruited an amazing team of, of, of teachers and, and architects and stonemasons I mean the story is so rich mm -hmm. in, in so many different directions but um, Mary Rockwell Hook was recruited as the school architect and uh, her stipulation to taking the job was that they would give her free reign. And so uh, Mary Rockwell Hook was one of the first. Yeah, that's everybody's. You know, <laughs> just let me do what I want to do. You know? and she was one of the first prominent female architects in the United States uh, at the time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, couldn't even go to school uh, mm -hmm. to study architecture mm -hmm. in the U in the U.S. So she went to France. Um, she was from Kansas City, came back and, and uh, got connected to, to Pettit and, and they built this amazing place and you know, you know still I, here. I, I, I get pretty geeked out and thinking about her designs and yeah. I'm by no means an, any, uh, an expert in architecture, but the way that she laid laid this campus out in terms of mm -hmm. protecting productive land and mm -hmm. uh, and usable land. I talk as I, as I introduce this to the kids, I talk all the time that you know, uh, so Catherine Pettit, along with Ethel DeLong, come from Hyman Settlement School, which had started uh, in 1902 and was the first rural settlement school and part of that uh, kind of settlement movement that started in England and come over to New York and Chicago. And then um, uh, Catherine Pettit and May Stone made it uh, come to life in a rural setting for the first time in Hyman in 02 and, and uh, 
of course, Catherine Pettit and them come over here and, and you know, I talked to them about how it was so important for a boarding school at that point in time to be so self-sufficient and, and you know, they had to have land and resources to be able to, to do what they, uh, to, to not only provide things, but they had to feed every kid that they mm-hmm. had on campus <laughs> uh, and every staff member that they had on campus. Yeah. So it was kind of their responsibility, the school's responsibility uh, to take care of them. And uh, so, so land was an issue, and and you know, so myself, I kind of went through this kind of same journey. I was at Heinemann, uh before I had this job, so I made that same journey coming this mm-hmm. way. And and I think many times driving from my house here, and I kind of live in between the two, the two settlement schools. I kept I I, I think all the time of what did they think uh, coming through because they come through some pretty gnarly yeah. steep. Um, just terrible land. Uh, I mean, mountainous, uh, a mountain, a creek, and a mountain kind of type, type <laughs> land. And uh, what were they thinking as they come through that wilderness to try to get here and 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 then open up to this gorgeous piece of property? I mean, it really had to be a little serendipitous and and of just like, oh, this, this is, is the omen yeah, of that. This, this is, is where it's yeah. at. Right. Um, so uh, I, th- I think it's a it's a, just a true story. But of yeah. course. Um, you know, Mary Rockwell Hook took that idea of sustainability and self-sufficiency further with the way she planned out campus. And even as it's developed over the time I've been coming, you know, you don't even think about it. You know, whenever I show, first showed up, didn't even put it in my head until I thought, this is laid out. The, the flat land is used for yes. crops, and it, that's all there. All the buildings are up on the hill because yep. that's where they can be. That's mm-hmm. the best place for yep. them to be. It, it is, yep. and, and you know, and, and her her mindset was they needed a look of the mountain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, a lot of times we'll be in we'll be with a group in the Laurel House, which is our kind of our main campus. Mm-hmm. It's where our dining room is, and we're talking. And I'll ask, how many people seen the chapel as they come in? Mm-hmm. And, and probably nine out of ten, or maybe ten out of ten, sometimes <laughs> never see it. Yeah, and yeah. it's the most gorgeous chapel, uh, and it's kind of the focal point coming to end the gate. But it mm-hmm. is built, and it looks it's mm-hmm. built uh, with and of the mountain, yep. and and yep. you know, and then that that next person on that team, I think Preston probably was going to is Luigi Zondi, who mm-hmm. who came into this part of the world um, working in the coal mines in Benjamin Lynch, and. Uh, uh, a huge Italian population there. I guess they went there, maybe re- did some recruitment and pulled Luigi Zondi here uh, mm-hmm. to work uh, uh, and and to build. And as you see on campus, it most everything is stone yeah. uh, and and locally harvested wood. So. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think the chapel. They said they were talking about that. And again, you can get married at the chapel. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, yep. uh, which is very beautiful. Um, is made out of one was one big one, boulder. one big story, boulder yeah. they broke it up and built built it which is, man I just sat there and I think that was a big <laughs> boulder yeah, it was, a, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was yeah. real big um, you know and and back to the kind of sustainability and self sufficiency that they were they were trying to do they were trying to create a a, a true functioning not only school but farm and and farmstead and homestead and yep. livelihood yep. Um, for the community right. and, you know one of the first things that they did when they hired Luigi Zondi was to build a reservoir which mm-hmm. still is today the way that we get our water and yeah. and uh, if you ever get a chance to go look at it it's absolutely it's nice. it's gorgeous yeah. yep. um, but we now pump it out and 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 it runs through I guess Kentucky's smallest municipal water district <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, yeah, because, gravity fed and it's all gravity fed yep. and and uh, to kind of go on and maybe not history now, but uh, we'll be history in a few years. So we're kind of turning back uh, to some of that self-sustainability and um, uh, self-sufficiency that they had. You know, this was one of the first places on this side of the mountain that had electricity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you look um, just underneath the hill from the from the chapel uh, is a, a stone building that was the, the generator house or the yeah. power house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going back to that and just outside of where we're sitting now, we're putting in a micro hydroelectric plant where we take the water coming off of the uh, off of the, the reservoir uh, and turn it into electricity. There you go. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty impressive. We have we have a saying here at Pine Mountain that we've done things for so long that they've become new again. Yeah. And it's it's so true. It yeah. really is. And back to the you know the agricultural history and the design of campus and and you know keeping the crop lands and pasture lands open. Uh, as Jason alluded to, you know all these families in, in the valley at the time were subsistence farmers. You have to think this was really before. 
uh, the the big coal boom yeah. in the in the late teens and early twenties here in Harlan County, and and so you know they were very much educating these kids. They were giving them a life education. Yeah. They were they were going to send them back to the farm to their you know their farmsteads with with science based information to be able to produce better quality crops and 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 better uh, livestock and uh, and to have a better life um, and to prepare them you know for the future whatever that might be as well. Not just to go back for the to the farm, but uh, but you know, it acted in in a way really as a, as an ag experiment station, and uh, I think Pandit had a lot to do with uh, with founding the um, the what is now the University of uh, Kentucky um, uh, research station at Quicksand um, Robinson Forest. She had something to do with that too. But you know that that whole ag uh, ag uh, extension work was you know ran obviously through the students and to the students, but to the family. So they would have. They would have field days, and they would have mm-hmm. what what was actually the original Harlan County Fair, which we still have, and it's our Fair Day. So in September, we have the Pine Mountain Fair Day. Um, you know that history goes back over a hundred years, and yeah. they would invite the local families to come out and, and see, you know, what was going on on campus. And so, still today, we carry that work on through our community agriculture program that we've operated now in partnership with Grow Appalachia for thirteen years, mm-hmm. and so we have. Um, this year we've got thir- uh, 30 some families in the program and we're providing free educational opportunities, seeds, tools, fertilizer, uh, and they can come out and see us, you know, how we put these things in practice here on the campus farm today. So, yeah. So, more on, so on history in 1913, uh, uh, this kind of all magic uh, began and, uh, and it ran as a boarding school pretty much. Uh, a typical boarding school students would work either on the farm or in the kitchen or in there uh, in the studios or shops and and uh, create things they would bring college would then sell those things uh, for the school to to help generate revenue and uh, they tried to be as self-sufficient as possible Uh, and then at 40 1949 40 49 uh, the the boarding school ended and it became a county school Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ran ran as that you know that kind of county uh, day school through 1972 uh, when the county built a new K through 8 school up the road here and essentially replaced the need for Pine Mountain in in that system so Mm -hmm. at that point that's the school shifted to focus on visiting school groups like like Crab Orchard and Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know local schools um, doing day trips and things like that as well and so yeah that's 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 uh, there's been several iterations of the program through the years, but really there's there's a lot of common threads. So that's one thing that's yeah. I, that I think is amazing about this place. There's not a lot of organizations, nonprofits, schools that have been around for over a hundred years that have kept, I believe, as close to their original mission as we have. Yeah. And of course, things change, needs mm-hmm. change, and you know there's there's all obviously um differences but there are a lot of things that uh, mm-hmm. that are I, I feel like right right there where they where they wanted to be originally when they mm-hmm. set out to to start this school yes yeah. completely yeah. It, it's pretty interesting to sit back and watch and uh, and and think about the true greatness that happened here and uh just the 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 tremendous leaders that it took to get this started in 1913 and mm-hmm. the um and and how they convinced you know, I think a lot of times we it's it's thought of that, you know, this community and in and, and this region can sometimes kind of be walled off against outsiders. Yeah. But mm-hmm. here we got to, you know, the the and it was the settlement model I think that made it so easy. Is is you know the 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 settlement model would focus on on you know the classics and Shakespeare and and classical music and um, and you know and then common stuff but then they would also look at the culture in that community uh and and teach that as well so Mm -hmm. the culture didn't die and i think that um made it a whole lot easier for for catherine pettit and ethel delong to uh come in here to the mountains and to as strangers and and win the community over to where they would send their kids here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was it, it's it's pretty remarkable to think about it. And 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 of course, we in strong uh, uh, position in the community and mm-hmm. helped because he was saying hey, these 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 folks are legit. But yeah. it, it's a it's a, it's a really interesting story, and it's pretty remarkable what's happened here. Yeah. Yeah, and that you know they they wrote about it a lot that model and that that thinking um, as a bridge a bridge of learning so mm-hmm. they understood that uh, yes we have you know 
the best and latest information, you know, science-based information, and we've got, you know, world-class educators we're going to send down there to help these these children of the Kentucky mountains, but there are also things that we can learn from yeah. these people yeah. that we're yeah. serving, and that's what they viewed it as a bridge, that yes, mm -hmm. there there's learning to be had on both sides of yeah. that bridge, and there's a really uh, a really neat way that, uh, that, I believe it was Pettit put it, she said that, uh, you know, uh, talking about Aunt Sal Creech, William's wife, that, you know, Catherine Pettit, she herself had traveled everywhere, been around the world and seen everything, but that Aunt Sal could spin and weave and you know Pettit was was a, was, a uh, was very much interested in and studied weaving and the plant-based mm -hmm. dyes and all that information had had like i said that culture had eddied out here a lot of those the scots irish um descendants were gilded weavers in the old mm -hmm. world and that knowledge you know world-class knowledge was still preserved almost right. in pure form same with the folk dance and the ballads mm -hmm. and, and all of that was still here and they recognized it you know they recognized the value in that yeah well and that's a, that's a really good point because like i think of like Cap, Cap, Kathleen, Cap, Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. Yep. yeah Catherine Pettit you know she was in Lexington, you know, if you yep. want to say city, you yep. know, and, and coming out here. And mm -hmm. it's that common ground of education, you know, mm -hmm. learning from each other and so forth. And, yep. you know, you think about, you know, what, what does what does this little mountain out here have to offer? But, I mean, yep. everything. I mean, yep. self-sustainability, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big thing. Yep. And, and going through that time period and so much, you know, you always talk about people from Eastern Kentucky. They say they talk more like the Queen's English, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it didn't, it it never edited away or it right. you know stayed and that's kind of the way i mean it's exactly that as far as migration goes you know i've had students we have a student on our trip today who his uh, great aunt and great uncle were born here yeah you know wow. we had a student who came um well she didn't come because she said i'm not going because my family's all up from there anyway and her <laughs> her, her grandma is a descendant from Sally Sally uh, Creech and them, wow. and like you know, they have a picture somewhere that we were up here, and they were like, "Yeah, that's that's Mercedes's great great grandmother or whatever." Uh -huh. And I was like, yeah. "Wow, you know." But you think about just migration and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. That's the uh, uh, way it goes. Yeah. It, it's it's pretty interesting to to look at that. Somebody else was here, um, I guess from Louisville last week or week before, and. Uh, of course, Judy, our community coordinator, knows everybody and everybody's <laughs> grandma, great grandma. <laughs> yeah. And it took her about three seconds to figure out that this lady, uh, great grandma, lived down the road. And you know, and it, it's a, it is, it's such a small world, and and uh, uh, it's pretty interesting to find those those connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it tells a lot that uh, Kat, Catherine, you know, uh, Aunt Sal, is that what? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, was able to. Um, uh, well, learn just as much from Aunt Sal than she did from traveling the world. Yeah. And uh, that's, I mean, it's one of, one of those things history can teach us, you know. Uh, for sure. Yes. And, you know, and, that, and that, that's still the model today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as we do programs and as we do education, we look a lot of times for those within the community that are experts. Yeah. We had a garden class the other day, and I may have led a little of that garden class, but I let the education go between folks telling stories and what's worked for them and and mm -hmm. and i learn just as much or more than what i'm trying to tell them when we get into that part and you know i think that's that that's an, a really interesting educational model that mm -hmm. um, uh, has has worked here for 109 years yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's truly community learning you know and uh, and it, it it has worked for for a long time and and there's still so much validity to it and and you know as we go on and we see uh, you know, y'all. I think talked about it. Just the disconnection uh, from nature and from from place and from even people. <laughs> these these models and and this approach becomes even more critical and important. I think to the to the future of our children and communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it it goes uh, you know to say their their work. You know, the creatures, Pettit and, and DeLong and and all those people. I mean. Do you think they were thinking a hundred years from now this place will still be going? This might have been their hope. That might have been their hope, but yeah, well, William Creech said he, he said he <laughs> deeded his land. He was very, you know, he had he had, he had dreams. He, yeah. did. He, had, he said as long as the Constitution of the United States stands, <laughs> he said I've deeded my land well, there you go. for the for the school and its purposes. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's good. That's a good. That's a good point. Uh, anyway, anything else to add? No, no. I, I mean, we with. could go on and on and uh, chase all kinds of little trails. And that's what you just have to come see it for yourself. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, 
And what it, there's the, the great thing about this place is we can we can serve a a you know vast array of interests and 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 people and and whatever your interest might be. Um, I'm sure there's something here for you, yeah. Pine Mountain. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. Yeah, well, maybe maybe next 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 April we'll we'll go down another one of those trails. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, well, I thank you guys both for coming on, and uh, of course, this is April recording this. It probably will be a few months or so before we get it out there. But I would highly recommend everybody booking a trip, a school trip, or just a personal trip. Yep. Come out here and check out Pine Mountain. Definitely a a top Kentucky history podcast travel location. That something, I guess, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, a <laughs> uh, place to be. Yep. But. Anything else? Thanks, guys, for coming on. Thank you all so yeah, much. It's been good. Come all see right. us. Yes. Yep. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.